Hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thanks for joining. Uh, very excited about today's webinar. We have a, an excellent panel. Um, you know, if you're here expanding to the US, how important it is um, in our market. I think it's 50x the size of you know our additional our, our initial market, and so exciting opportunity for for all of us looking at it, but but very challenging as well. And um, those of you that know Kate know that we love bringing great people together um, to help founders and startups overcome these challenges in, in the best possible way. And we all need as much help as we can get. Um, so today we have you know, a wonderful team of experts um, around expanding to the US from the legal side of things to employment, recruitment um, and building, building teams. So we should be able to cover um, a lot of those challenges. Uh, Kate's currently expanding. And so we've got experience of this firsthand working with all, all of these partners and, you know, I can, I can vouch for, um, you know, the quality of the content we're going to be able to put forward today. So thanks for joining. Uh, this is recorded. So we understand some of you are able to attend in person or virtually today. Um, we want you to please ask us questions. One of the benefits of being here live is that you get to actually ask questions and get them answered directly, which, which is a big advantage. Uh, of course, we try and cover the best content we can in, in general, but please do ask questions. So um, it's good if you can share what stage you're at um, in your expansion. Are you still at idea stage? Are, are you getting going over there already? Are you, are you really scaling up in the US? So where are you on that journey? I think if you can share that in the chat, um, share questions in the chat, it's going to make sure that we can um, you know, make our information as relevant as possible. So. Make sure you use that that chat. Um, yeah, so Cake is um, super passionate, as you know, about helping startups to scale and specifically uh, helping startups uh, with their equity to create value for, for their teams and for investors. From a Cake side of things today, I'll be playing uh, two roles. So as a company, you know, we can help with a range of equity related uh, matters when moving to the US from, uh, you know, company set up, uh, stock option plans, you know, your cap table and capital raising. Uh, we have guides and toolkits as well on our website to check out. Uh, but we also have experience in expanding. Um, you know, we've become a Delaware C Corp. Uh, we've pitched and raised money from US investors, including Jason Calacanis, pretty, pretty wild. Um, you know, we've done advisory shares in the US. We're hiring and we're going to market there. So hopefully I can bring some context from, from the founder side of things as well. So... Um, yeah, so successfully expanding to the US can make or break, um, you know, many of the milestones for, for us founders. Um, you know, it can open up huge markets. It can be the first step in, in global growth. And if successfully executed, it can be the catalyst for unlocking future funding rounds, um, getting interest from international investors. So, you know, incredibly important milestone for, for many um, startups expanding. Um, you know, there's great names that have done this before. Uh, you know, Canva, Mr. Yarm, Atlassian have been very successful and, and we can all see the growth trajectories um, that they're on. But what does it take? You know, um, there's a hell of a lot to learn. Um, this panel um, have helped hundreds of startups on this journey um, from setting up, flipping up, hiring, you know, running and rewarding US teams. So, you know, we have, we've got you covered. Um, so, Without um, taking up too much time, I'll I'll hand over to the amazing panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm just going to go from left to right on my screen. Um, Jeremy, uh, do you want to um, say good day, mate? And yeah, yeah, let everyone know what you're up to. Thanks, Jason, and thanks for uh, thanks for the invite to to be here. Um, so I'm a Kiwi who lives in Sydney but runs a recruitment business in the US um, and. Have gone through this, you know, this exact expansion that you talk about. Went over to the US, started a business. Um, now have staff that are employed in the US, and uh, we specialize in helping companies build their sales and marketing teams. Um, and I would say, of our customer base, about fifty percent are non-US originated companies. So really, have a heavy focus on foundational hires, building teams that are in different places to where the companies have originated and where the head offices are. Um, obviously something that is very important to get the right people and um, something that we are super passionate about. And um, I guess as a Kiwi, I'm really passionate about helping Anzac companies get to the US, really start to compete on the global stage and, 
and win by building really good teams. Amazing, very important part of expansion. I remember catching up with your colleague up in San Francisco um, a couple of months ago and, you know, getting those insights into a new market, um, you know, such a big, um, such a big advantage. So, yeah, looking forward to learning more. Uh, next up, we have Kathy again, caught up with you. Um, we've been partnering for quite some time, I think, uh, right since the beginning of our expansion. And uh, I think you've been responsible for helping many Aussie startups, um, you know, getting up into yeah. the US. And so, yeah, yeah, really excited to have you on. You want to um, say, say hi and, and share yeah. a bit with, with the team? Yep. Yep. Um, good evening from San Francisco. I'm Kathy Weber Gardner, a partner in a boutique corporate law firm here in San Francisco called Montgomery Pacific. We call it boutique because that means it's small. Um, my partner and I uh, started this firm over a decade ago after leaving partnerships in multi-international law firms in, in the U.S. Uh, we focus on working extensively with Australian and New Zealand uh, tech and life science companies. And we help companies get incorporated in the US. We work with them to do their, um, you know, corporate, uh, the CEO level type of offer letters, confidentiality agreements. We help them translate their Australian commercial agreements to US. Uh, we are mergers and acquisitions lawyers. We work on equity financings, and which includes safes. And we do flip ups, which I think we'll be talking about later if you're not familiar with what that means. And finally, we'll set up for US companies, we'll set up their stock option plans. Amazing, very relevant to, to today. Cake's been through. Uh... I think all of those things and you know it's, it's a lot and so yeah really important to learn these things and also have access to great partners that can help you tackle these problems so last but certainly not least one of our best partners deal uh, one of the fastest growing companies ever in the history of the universe um and and great great um you know person in the local e ecosystem georgie yeah um, yeah so good day. thanks jace hi everyone uh, thanks for taking the time to join with us today. Um, yeah, so Deal, I work for Deal in partnerships, but Deal is a business that allows uh, companies all over the world to compliantly hire and pay staff, um, contractors and employees um, all over the world. The idea for, for Deal is that um, the founders came out of MIT. They were um, friends at MIT and they wanted uh, businesses to be able to hire the best talent and they wanted employees and contractors or people around the world to be able to work for organizations around the world that they wanted to work for and so that businesses could capture you know the best talent regardless of where where they live um, and you know without the need for those employees or contractors to have to move countries and to you know be able to work from where they they live and with their families and but still be able to work for the companies and the the best companies in the world and the the companies that they want to work for absolutely love that and why we love partnering with you is because you solve all that component of the problem and then cake you know cake's idea is that we can help solve equity in a very similar way it's super complex to do cross border and so you know we work so well together and long may that continue all right wonderful well so look we've got we've got the panelists everybody knows what we're here to tackle um so let's start a little bit broad and a little bit general. We've all seen a lot of companies expanding. We've all seen things go right, things go wrong. So let's sort of like set the team with a, some pros and cons about why um, why the US. So um, maybe we just do a little bit of pros and cons from each of us. Uh, let's go in reverse order this time. Um, Georgie, like why, why would companies be going to the US? And, you know, what have you seen? Uh, obviously, it's a big market. But, um, you know, anything more specific that, that you would like to highlight uh, on the pros and cons side of things? I think particularly for Australia and New Zealand businesses, um, what we see here is that just, you know, the total addressable market um, that you that you get access to by, by going to the US and expanding to the US. And I think if you can validate your product in the US, then um, in addition to what you've done in perhaps in Australia and New Zealand, then you know, you're know you capturing one, a greater audi audience, and then you're building um, additional value into your business. And that means that you can then attract investors um, to, um, you know, to invest in, in your business. Um, I think the other, another thing to sort of think about is, 
expanding to the US gives you um, access to a um, another time zone or just, you know, the ability to kind of capture another time zone outside of because Australia definitely sits in an, an area where it, it's difficult to, um, you know, capture the, <laughs> the rest of the, the world market. Um, but yeah, that would be, those would be some of the, the advantages to kind of, I guess, accessing the, the US uh, market. Awesome. Anyone else want to, I guess, share pros and cons that they've seen that are, I guess, outside those, outside what George has shared, or you want to double down on those? I mean, they're definitely totally valid points, Jason. And I think, uh, I guess, from a recruitment perspective, looking at the talent that you're able to get access to in the US and just the expertise that comes with it, I think you're able to tap into really seasoned professionals who have been there, done that. They've kind of, they have really good playbooks. They have the expertise of taking a company from a certain level and growing it exponentially. And, um, you know, in Australia and New Zealand, those skills are definitely growing and developing and we're getting more expats coming back that have kind of done it internationally and want to help to bring the next layer of talent through to get that expertise as well. But it is just, you know, there's so much more plentiful in the US to get hold of those people that have that expertise. And then, you know, the market size, the deal size that you can be doing over there. I think when you talk about the revenue numbers that people can achieve and the sales volume they can achieve in a market like the US compared to Australia and New Zealand, it um, is a real game changer for, for companies heading over there. Absolutely. Kathy, what's your thoughts? Anything to add on that one? Well, I'm a little biased. So I'm here, <laughs> but um, I'll say that initially when I started working with Australian companies quite a long time ago, I was amazed at the flow of Australian tech and life science companies coming to Silicon Valley and outside and elsewhere outside Silicon Valley. And there's just, even with COVID, there is just no end. So clearly um, I'm seeing a lot of attraction uh, to the US market and a lot of clear benefits. Um, and there's a lot of U.S. money that's eager to invest in Australian companies, which is a good thing. Um, so I don't have any cons, and I think you probably know why. So <laughs> No, I love it. I love it. Look, from my side of things, I think on the pro, uh, and this was very relevant for Kate, the leading companies and the best practices in your industry quite often are in the U.S. So I think... By taking that step, which can be a very challenging step because the competition's higher, um, it can help to elevate you towards the forefront of your your industry and your niche, uh, which then can help you with further expansion. And it's certainly a strategy that we're you know we're working towards. Um, it it does open up later stage rounds. I think in Australia, you know, you've kind of got your seed Series A is pretty strong, but Series B, Series C is very very weak, and quite often they're done internationally anyway. So you kind of got to think, well, would I? hopefully I'm not saying the wrong thing. I, I think it is like it's a, it's a weaker you know, part of our market here. I think it's been developing definitely, but I think B, C, D, E, you know, like they're all pretty common, very strong. They've been operating for a lot longer in the US. So um, that's that's a nice thing to be thinking forward a couple of rounds. Like when am I going to take that step? Well, as soon as you take the step and you get the traction, you do open up a further opportunity there, in my opinion. And a con that I've noticed um, is just the size of the US. And one of the mistakes we made early on was like going to market in the US, uh, which was a bit of a, an F up. So now we're going to market in LA and Denver specifically um, so that we can actually really understand those cities and the context of those cities and build trust and, and actually get like a whole marketing mix going with quite a small team and a small budget. And, and looks like that's, you know, really helping us because, you know, there's there's different regions, they talk differently, they think differently, you know, they buy differently. And that is a level of complexity that you don't have to really um, handle in Australia. And so it is a, it's a con, it is something that you need to get across and it's quite challenging. So anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> Actually, Jason, thank you. You have helped me think of a con, um, which is what you just said. I, my clients are always shocked. The ones that haven't really worked in the US before are shocked to find out that we have um, 50 states with their each having their own laws. And um, once I was asked when I thought the United States would turn away from that, and I just pointed them to the musical Hamilton, um, <laughs> and that's never going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's alarming to Australians to have to deal with that. Um, I'm going to talk later about 
how there's an easy answer about where you're going to incorporate, but um, it takes some getting used to, and it's from not just a corporate, but from a tax perspective. All this, all yeah. the and I think that leads to why this panel is so important because there are hacks, there are best practices, there are ways around the complexity to some degree. And of course, you don't, you can't get around all the complexity, but you can certainly avoid the worst of it in the first few years when you're having a lot of other problems to deal with. Um, so yeah, we're definitely helping you tackle some of that today. Um, so the next bit, I think we can, it's a little bit similar. And so perhaps we can dig into that in a little bit more detail, which is, you know, key differences. You know, I think one of the trickiest things is what don't you know? And I think one of the best things advisors can do is help founders, you know, see around some corners a little bit, you know, so you don't have to bump into every challenge. Um, and so, you know, you might've been a founder in Australia for several years and, and now you're looking at the US and so, I guess specifically around employment, recruitment, um, you know, and, and the legals and equity and the setup. Are there some key differences that we can just highlight straight off the bat to help people uh, maybe jot down a few things to to look into? This is an open one. Jump in. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll jump in first, I guess, from a recruitment point of view. I mean, look, there's there's pros and cons to the differences between Australia and uh, and the US uh, in terms of the regulations. As Kathy said, you've got 50 states that you need to be mindful of what the laws are from an employment perspective in every state. And using California as an example, you can have people that can quit a job one day and start another job the next day um, perfectly legally. They can go and work for a competitor perfectly legally the next day. There's no non-competes. They're very hard to enforce um, in, in a number of states in the US. So you have to be mindful of securing yourself, your customer base, making sure you have a good employment um, agreements that are you know, legislated correctly for the state that you're in. And that is a mistake that a lot of people make thinking that the US has sort of core employment law and that it's very easy to have something that's structured across every state, but you need to be quite specific as to where you've employed your people. Um, but equally, a lot, more, a lot more litigious as well, right? From what I'm very, hearing, like, yeah. If so you, you have... muck up your employment law, and then somebody leaves, or, or maybe not even even if they leave, I think it's much easier to get yourself in in trouble, particularly in states like California. Totally, and you have uh, protected classes for employees where certain people are protected more than others, and so you have to be really mindful about your performance, um, sort of performance management plan that you take people through as well. But equally, it means. When you hire somebody, they can start with you the next day. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if I'm planning to get somebody on board by this date, things can actually move very quickly. You can start a recruitment process on the first of the month and have somebody started with you that month if you move through your recruitment process and because notice periods are a bit shorter. Yeah, very interesting. I think it also means, you know, perhaps to make sure your stock option plan is well set up because if they can legally switch very quickly, you probably want to make sure that you've got them engaged and retained as best you can with the right milestones and, and incentives to sticking with the company. That's only one element. And of course, there's other, you know, cultural elements that you can bring in to try and make sure you, you keep your best people. But um, we'll talk a little bit more about stock option plans as we go. Um, any other key differences people want to highlight? Well, just uh, building on what Jeremy said, his point is super well taken about the concept of whether you can have a non-compete or not. I'm, I'm from Ohio where uh, non-competes are fine, but as a California lawyer, Jeremy's right, you, they can't happen here. And that takes people a while to, to get adjusted to. Um, and Jeremy's other point about this con US concept of employment at will, that's across all 50 states. And it just means to what Jeremy said, that you can hire or fire somebody for any reason or no reason. Hire you today, tomorrow, I hate the color of your shirt, goodbye, see you, leave, you know. And of course, the nuances also, as Jeremy mentioned, is you can't discriminate of, against people when you're hiring and firing or when you're firing. Um, and you have to be very careful about that. But conceptually, you can have what we call, we call them employee offer letters, not even agreements because they're an offer of employment. Welcome, here's your title, here's what you're gonna make, here's your benefits. Remember you're an employee at will. And uh, we'll take our Australian clients' employment agreements, which are substantial, and we'll winnow those down to like two pages here because there's just not that much, except if you're dealing on the um, senior officer level, so. Awesome, Georgie, we covered it? 
okay the on this thing, one? Yeah, the mm. other thing I was just going to mention is the payroll side of things. Because you've got a different employment laws in each state, you've also got different payroll laws in each state. So oh. um, something to be really <laughs> mindful of is um, if you are going to be employing in people in multiple different states, that's something to consider. You've got, you know, the taxes, the lodgements, the reporting um, on the payroll side of things. So very, um, very important to be mindful of, of that when you're, you know, choosing to employ people across different states. And do you know anyone that can help with that? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. All <laughs> oh, right. No, very good. Very good. I also did um, I was used to work for a, um, a payroll technology company for the last seven years. And, you know, we, it was an Australian payroll technology company and we were looking at, you know, the US and we went to the UK and New Zealand, first of all, because I mean, the US is just, you know, it, it is like you've got 50 different um, sets of legislation for payroll. So it's a, it's um, a game changer, I think, when you are considering employing in the US. Oh, for sure. There's so much complexity and, you know, platforms are, are critical, I think, to handle that complexity. So, all right, wonderful. I was highlighting some differences and some pros and cons. Let's get into some nitty gritty. Let's get into some basic setup stuff. I think, Kathy, we'll start with you. Um, first question, if you want to be operating in the US, so just say we're, you know, we want to get up there. We just want to be operating. We want to be yeah. having some US customers. Um, do you need a US company at that point? Yeah. Um, one more time that I'm kind of biased, right? Um, I think you do. But I've had lots of Australian companies that I've talked with that have sort of gauged and weighed and balanced when do they have to actually go forward instead of a US company. And, you know, maybe they'll enter into a few US customer contracts with their the what I call the Australian parent. But at some point, you're doing enough business, you're starting to hire people here, and you need the protection of a US entity to wall off any potential liability from the Australian parent. So that, then it becomes pretty uh, important to have that. Let's dig into that a tiny bit. So I think at that point, people have got two decisions to make. Do I have an Australian parent company with a US subsidiary to handle that US risk and operation? Or do I flip up and become a US parent entity, uh, potentially with US subsidiary and an, and a, an Australian subsidiary, which is what Kate did. And I would suggest that one of the biggest decisions, or one of the biggest factors in making that decision is who are your investors going to be and where do they want your parent company to be. Some investors in the US will only invest in a US company. That's quite common. Uh, it is becoming more common to for US investors to invest globally, but it's not not the majority and there's still a lot of complexity for them. And, and I think ideally they would like you to have a Delaware C Corp in, in most circumstances. So that's one big factor to take into account. So, so if we're not just so the first example is, look, we're not getting any US investors now, but we'd like to test out the US market. Um, we're a software as a service company. What would be sort of the trigger points in your opinion when you might say, all right, we've, we've tested the waters, um, but we really should have like a US subsidiary now? Yeah, I think once you start engaging in a substantial way with US customers and you've mm. got employees or consultants on the ground, that's usually the line that's drawn. And when people decide to move forward, Australian companies, and I'm assuming that our audience has an Australian company because if they're founders in Australia that are heading straight here, that's a different story. But for Australian entities that are existing, you, usually that's how they decide. And um, when they decide that, the good news is the answer is pretty simple about what they do. Um, because most of our clients are going to eventually seek venture capital, they will set up in Delaware as a Delaware entity. Uh, do you want me to yeah. talk about that or is that a little too below this? I think, I think we should cover it quickly and just make okay. sure everybody knows it's the only state you incorporate in and you get a C-Corp and yeah. like that's just do that. <laughs> um, against what I just said about our 50 equal United States, um, we Delaware decided decades ago that it was going to leap ahead of every other state and it has the most sophisticated company-friendly laws in the US. So it, it broke the rule that I just described. And because it did, most US public companies are Delaware Corps. 
VCs don't even want to think about another state. They want you to be a Delaware C Corp. Um, as I said, most sophisticated laws. So we just steer our companies straight to becoming a Delaware C Corp. Another anomaly is even though I'm a California lawyer, I am per permitted to advise as to Delaware corporate law. And that is almost all I do um, for the reasons we just talked about. So. I can totally understand that. So we also see LLCs and people might hear about LLCs. I'll just quickly touch on that from our experience and we're doing some research on it. So an LLC for Aussies is kind of like a sole trader partnership yeah. kind of thing. So it allows you to do some stuff and trade and what have you. And there's a little bit of benefit to the way that is, but it's sort of like a day one thing. Like just say you start off with a sole trader in Australia, you, then you get your company. It's a bit like that. So as soon as you want to get investment, like you might be able to get your friends and family around done with an LLC and yeah. you can sort of have like a stock option-y sort of thing, but like you just shouldn't do it. Please don't do it. Like if you're going to be up there, it's all C-Corp. So just to let you know that it's there and someone might talk to you about it, but just skip over that completely because it's only going to cause you problems. If, if someone's giving you that kind of advice and I'm talking to the audience, they are not experienced in working with startups. They just aren't. Because sure, LLCs are a great thing for U.S., restaurants and things like that but that's not what you all are trying to do and so you probably are talking to the wrong people so yeah right right and georgie you know you're like obviously big in the employment and contractor space and hiring and building teams and and how deal works potentially delays or enhances or changes a little bit about how you might need to think about your entity structures and stuff so i think it'd be wonderful to hear your opinion on on how that side of things works and how deal could help um, in that situation too. Yeah, so deal um, definitely it allows businesses to before you go through that commitment phase of establishing an entity, um, you can test the market, you can you know validate your product in a new market. Um, and what what deal has done around the world is to, is uh, put together go to market teams around the world to expand into new regions, um, and so. What we see with our Australian companies and, and APAC is probably is the second fastest growing region in terms of hiring abroad. So we saw between June, January to June 2022, 151% um, increase in Australian companies actually hiring abroad. And one of the top five companies, uh, sorry, countries is the US. Um, so they might just get a footprint um, for a period of time to establish themselves in, in the US um, and uh, validate their product in the market before establishing uh, an entity there. So if you're not signing contracts and things like that, and, and um, Kathy can obviously talk to this in a lot more detail and legalese and so forth, but if you, if you, if you just need a footprint there, you know, to have some people on the ground to establish dis distribution networks for a period of time, salespeople, um, content writers, depending on, you know, whether you want to hire people as contractors or full-time employees, you can, you can do either. Um, but until until such time that you decide that you want to establish, you can use a system like Deal to to hire people on the ground in the US to to validate your product and to to um, you know establish your, yourselves there for a period of time until such time that you decide to establish an entity. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, and and finding those those sort of trigger points is an important part of your expansion strategy. And you know, do you need an entity? Are you going to have you know Deal helping? One of the cool things we like about working with Deal is um, it's not just our US team. Um, you know, we can have our team members all around the world sort of on the one platform. And so it helps us with the breadth of, uh, you know, finding talent and, and enabling them. And, you know, like if you have to pay them on Upwork and like it just becomes a bit of a palaver. So, um, you know, it's nice to have that um, the platform that helps, you know, with your team everywhere. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's awesome. It just gives um, you that flexibility. Um, just I'll just paint one picture to um, the prior company that I worked for. So we we did um, expand to the UK, and it, we were always uh, going to establish an entity. So we were in the process of establishing the entity, but it took us about six months to do that because our one of our directors had a family trust, and so the authorities look at that, and it takes you know a longer period of time to get that entity and the bank accounts established. So we could have used deal in that six month period to have someone onboarded on the ground, building brand awareness, making sales, building relationships. So, you know, it can serve multiple purposes and there's many use cases for it, but it does give you the flexibility. 
And we all know how important momentum is while we're burning X dollars every month and how painful that is. So, you know, I think understanding these different, um, I guess, opportunities is, is super, super important. I think the medium term is probably, you know, if you're going to be big and have a thousand employees in the country, you're probably going to have your own setup. But, you know, you have to work out how to get there first. Um, Jeremy, anything to add on this point, mate, um, from your perspective, I guess you're working with the actual hiring processes and, and yeah. with the employees. And, yeah. Uh, you, you kind of uh, sort of hit exactly the point that I was going to make there where I think it's probably guided by what your recruitment plan is for the US. So if you are planning on hiring a senior leader who's going to build out a substantial team, you're probably going to go down the, the road of setting up the entity relatively early so that that structure is in place. If your intention is to hire a couple of people, see how things work, um, candidates are totally comfortable with organizations like Deal where it doesn't create any sort of barrier to them joining an organization where they think there's not an entity here. Does that mean these guys are serious about the market? Organizations like Deal are becoming quite prevalent and it is a really great way for people to get to market quickly, validate, hire people, everything's set up for them so candidates know there's no kind of missing areas to my hiring process. You know, it's all perfectly legal. I'm covered under everything that I want to. But as you start to scale, then, yeah, you'll start to see that that transition happen. But I kind of have a, a foot in both camps because we have businesses that do both. It just depends on what they're, you know, how quickly they intend on scaling will we'll tend to lead them down one of those two roads. Yeah, I feel like the speed of scaling is a big part of it as well. Like if you're going holistic, like it yeah. can be nice to have a platform where you can just be, you know, really getting that done. And probably but the I, seniority of the candidate that you're hiring as well. If you're going in to hire a leader, they probably will want an entity that is there from the from the get-go. If you're hiring more of your individual contributor salespeople, you probably would, would look at deal where you can just get it, it moving a bit more quickly. Hey, let's cover quickly the employee versus contractor question. I think a lot of people when they're expanding, they're wondering um, which way should I go? What are the pros and cons? Um, Jeremy, from your perspective, um, are both a good opportunity or is one or the other much better um, when expanding? Um, is it a short-term versus long-term thing? Like, What are the major factors for people to consider? So I come at this from a sales recruitment, marketing recruitment headspace where very rarely will you get contract sales people. Typically you'll hire somebody on a permanent basis to, to do your sales because if they you know are on a contract and they could depart early, you're going to lose a lot of your momentum. I would say the overwhelming majority prefer permanent employment because of all the benefits that come with it. And um, like health insurance in the US is a particularly critical element where people feel more secure if they have, you know, health entitlement benefits that come with them being a permanent, uh, you know, permanent employee of the organization. And I have, you know, a very good personal story of why health insurance is so important. We had, my wife and I had a baby in the US and he was six weeks premature. We had to have, you know, in the be in the hospital for six weeks and, the bill for him was somewhere around half a million dollars. Um, but Whoa. because of health insurance, oh uh, we paid $3,000. So, you know, people always think worst case scenario in the US and, you know, health expenses are incredibly high if you don't have good coverage. So it tends to mean most people have a focus on being a permanent employee that will get those benefits. And it's difficult to attract people if you don't offer those uh, from the, you know, from the word go. I'm just going to stop this session now. Like if that's the only <laughs> takeaway everybody gets, like it's more than enough. No, that's incredibly insightful and, and valuable. And I suppose as business leaders to be able to provide those benefits for your team versus not, is like, you know, a wonderful thing. And we should all be you know looking to support our team members in that way. So yeah, And, and really look, cool. it's, it's very expensive to have health insurance for your employees, but it's critical. I mean, when you compare it to, we're, we're incredibly fortunate in Australia and New Zealand with the cost of health insurance, you're probably looking at six, $7,000 a year per employee for health insurance in the US as a bit of an average figure. But when you have things like this happen, you see actually that is really important sort of welfare and, and you know, um, being mindful of looking after your employees. And um, it will be a reason people won't join a business. And I think that's probably the, the most important thing to think about is getting really good talent. You can't let that sort of uh, stand in the way of, of getting the right people. 
Amazing. Georgie, anything to add on that? I suppose my first thought was, well, if you go through deal, you know, does, is this all organized and, you know, do the health benefits all get like packaged up somehow? Like how does that all happen? I've, I should know that, but uh, anyway, so luckily <laughs> I have a COO that knows all this. So you can teach me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the contractor side of things is obviously much more flexible. It's an arrangement between the business and the contractor. Um, there's no liability taken on by deal. And just for the audience's um, understanding, what we've been talking about is, so deal acts as an employer of record or EOR provider. And what that is, is we allow businesses to hire in a country where you don't have an entity. So that's as simple as that. So we we take on the liability um, when you are employing a full-time employee. And yes, um, health insurance is, can be bundled into that. So um, across the world, right. um, yeah, we work with a lot of providers around the world to, to offer health insurance, either as a, if it's, um, you know, mandatory or if it's an additional benefit to employees. But yeah, the contractor side of things does give businesses um, a lot, you know, much more flexibility um, because the contractor has to manage all their own taxes and lodgements and things like that. Whereas um, if you if you want more control, if you want to bring people on as team members, as Jeremy was sort of suggesting, you know, depending on where you're at in terms of the stage that you are in in, in your progress into a new market um, and who you're hiring will depend on, you know, whether you are happy bringing on people as a um, contractor or as a full-time employee and the types of roles that they're doing. So we also see a lot of businesses who might have five or six contractors on board and have, have been contractors for the business for a period of time. And they want to bring those, they, you know, they've identified the skills, like that these people have great skills, that they're part of the team, um, they're, they're real team members and they want to bring them on as full-time employees to have them as part of the team, have a little bit more control, offer the health benefits. Um, yeah, so we, we we definitely see sort of one, both, both sides. Um, we have about 110,000 employees and contractors hired through deal. Um, probably 10 to 20% of that is full-time employees. So um, particularly from Australia and New Zealand, businesses are more inclined to hire full-time employees as well. Um, just to offer the employees those benefits and and bring them in as part of your your team. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we, just to bring the audience in a little bit, so we've had a couple of questions so far. We've managed to answer them both just on the run. So well done, panel. Uh, one was about uh, which state to incorporate in, tick, and the other one was about when to you know, when you would need to set up an entity if you're hiring employees there. So I think we've done pretty well there. If you want more detail on those questions, please do put it in there. Um, now would be a good time. Like we came into this wanting to know things. Um, if there's anything we've talked about that you'd like more clarity on, now would be a great time to pop in the Q&A so I know how much time to leave. Otherwise, we've got plenty of really important um, content to come. So we'll probably run right up to the end of the hour for you. So um, yeah, so chuck any questions in there. So Moving right along, um, you know, we talked about hiring. <clears throat> Jeremy, I'm going to stick on the recruitment element of this a little bit with you because, in my opinion, the US expansion is more about customer generation, right? It's more about growth. It's more about market size. Like, you're not really going to the US to, you know, reduce your cost of your team, you know, or, um, well, I can't think of any other real reason why you would go there. It's very niche. Like, yep. It's really an expansion strategy, I think, for a lot of Australian customers. So the first top hires, um, I think, is like sales and marketing and yep. which one do you hire and what order? Um, what's the natural sort of like... I was even asking um, your teammate, you know, like, would it be an AE or an SDR and how do they work and what salaries they earn? And like, there's so much quality information. So I do recommend hitting up, you know, the search experience team after this. But, you know, I guess, is there any big topics um, or advice you would give people when going up to sales and marketing people, like maybe building your first few and then maybe scaling yep. up? Yep. Uh, it's a, a difficult question to sort of uh, distill a, a perfect answer because obviously every situation is a little bit different for each organization. And I guess the footprint they have in Australia and New Zealand can be different and can impact what hires they'll make. I think the the takeaways people should really get from this uh, webinar in terms of, you know, the what we've seen be successful is try and hire at least a couple of people when you go make that footprint. Uh, hiring one off and then waiting for that person to be successful and then build tends to be a much harder strategy. If you hire a couple of people, start building a bit of a culture, 
Um, you also just ins ins insulate yourself or insure yourself a little bit against the fact that you probably will have people come and depart your business. So um, you don't want to be constantly hiring one person. Maybe they work out, maybe they don't, and then you have to replace them and it becomes a bit stop-start for your customer base. Typically, I think the, the first couple of hires you want to make are people that are going to be selling directly to customers. So you want to get a couple of account executives that usually can generate their own leads, so can be pretty self-sufficient. Then you'll start to build a bit of a pod around them. So you'll bring in some SDRs. You may hire a sales engineer, depending on the complexity of your product. And then you probably want to hire some kind of player coach um, who can start to be a bit of a mentor and a leader to the people in region. Managing salespeople remotely is difficult. So the faster you can build a bit of late leadership uh, in the US, the better really. And whether that's someone from the mothership that heads over uh, to manage those people, or it's hiring somebody in the US that's dedicated to um, to being a player coach. But I think to keep costs down, you want to make sure that you have as many revenue generators as possible early on um, before you start to hire some of the more senior VP level um, structure that you'd want to put in place eventually. You want people that are really proving out the concept of selling into the US and, and being successful, and then you can build more of an infrastructure around them. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. We, we appreciated your advice. Um, that's exactly what we got. We got um, like an AE that can do, uh, he's actually an SDR that's converting into an AE, which helps yep. us a little bit with the cost associated with that role because good yep. AEs are like pretty hectic for Aussie startups. It's a bit of a shock um, when you first look. And so I guess from a founder perspective, really understanding what it's going to cost to go to market and making sure you've got enough capital, right? If I need one or two AEs, and then I need to put a couple of SDRs there and I need some leadership, like how many customers are gonna, am I going to need and how long is that going to take and where am I going to break even? And I think these things are all really, really important. So I'm sure you yeah, and I think- model. You got okay. good investors that support your strategy uh, and, and those sorts of things is pretty important because I think if you're half past it, you're going you're gonna to have a pretty bad time. <laughs> totally. And I, I always say to people, don't convert a US salary to Australian dollars. You'll just go to bed depressed at night because it's just, you know, it's a totally different market that you're operating in and um, your US people will be the highest paid people in your business more than likely. And that's just part of being, you know, in that market and selling to that market. But they should also generate more revenue for your business than anybody else in the organization. So it's just, it's a larger investment to make. Um, but I say to people, look, your, your first AE may earn more than your CEO. And, you know, that's hopefully a good thing for everybody because they generate a load of revenue that makes more money for everybody. Absolutely. And I think there was a rule that I learned recently, which is about five to one. So yep. if just say you're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars for an AE, they should be booking a million dollars worth of revenue yep. for you. And That's so a really good ratio. Can, if you can get that in your mind and then you can see that they're getting up to that pretty quickly, because I think one thing with US hiring as well, like they can move pretty quickly, but they're meant to get up to speed really, really quickly as well. So there's not this expectation of having like a long onboarding process. They're expecting to be like hitting quota, um, and and paying their way very quickly, and you should have that mindset so you're not burning a ton of cash um, while you're building your team as well. It's not the Aussie way, I don't think, but I think you need to be a little bit more hectic with your commercialism um, when you're over there because everybody else is, and you don't get many chances. That's it. Look, you're you're competing against people that uh, you know, particularly people that have raised money in the US. They have not unlimited budget, but somewhat, you know, they, they raise very large rounds, you know, 25, $30 million A rounds are not unusual in the US. And so them paying 20, 30, $40,000 more for somebody is just something that, it, you know, it becomes a bit of a rounding error when you think about what they will generate and the money that's been raised. Um, but they, they should ramp up quickly. That's the investment you're making is they should know my market. They should know the customer base that we're wanting to sell into and, um, the teething out process should be condensed significantly, which means we can start to generate the revenue we want really quickly. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, let's change tack a little bit. Um, fortunately, my little G up questions work very well. And we've had a little string of questions come through. So well done. If you've got a couple more, get them in now. I'll leave, I'll leave about 10 minutes at the end. We'll dig into those. 
Um, that, that's very valuable. Thank you. Um, but before we do that, we'll do a little bit around maybe raising capital and US investors. I think it's a it's a hugely important aspect of expanding. We get questions about this all the time. Um, you know, what do US investors need? What's the right timing and, and so on and so forth. So we'll just dig into that a little bit. So from my perspective, the timing and I'll, I'll ask if anybody, you know, has experience with this, but timing of US investors. Um, so I think there's some US investors will invest globally and they're looking for global opportunities. And so I think investing in general and capital raising is a matchmaking exercise. So if you want US investors, you would go and you would find the ones that are investing globally. Like Jason Calacanis, when he invested in us, he was specifically trying to get out of the mess and the valuations of San Francisco and get some valuations that weren't, he could actually get a return on. And I'm being a little bit facetious, but, you know, and so people are looking for international investments. If you can find them, great. That's option one. And I think every Aussie founder should probably be doing a little bit of that because they invest faster and harder, the valuations are better. And, you know, certainly that was the case with our round at the time. So there's an opportunity there. But I think, the majority of US investors still want to invest in companies that are US focused and you go into market in the US, have US customers, US revenue, and have proven that out. And that's still the vast majority. And so if you want to access them, that, you need to be there or you need to show why you're going to be there, when you're going to be there, and they need to be pretty convinced that, that that's going to work out. So normally that means you can't be doing pre-seed or seed. You need to be sort of seed past series A and beyond because how can a pre-seed company go to market in the US? I mean, unless you're going to move there. So that's another thing you can do, just move and base yourself there, but that's different. And that's definitely an opportunity. And I would probably recommend every founder doing that. I shouldn't say that, strain ecosystem supporter, but anyway, there's definitely some benefits to that. But um, yeah, so that that's sort of my opinion. Um, you know, and oh, I did want to also plug Austrade. So if you're looking to expand, please try and join the landing pad in San Francisco. It's so amazing. Like David and the team there, unbelievably helpful. We just went through it. We did the whole program. They taught us about the cultural differences, the sales and marketing differences, and just so many other things. So if you can get into that, please do try. I know um, Kathy's pretty connected in there. Um, if Georgie and Jeremy aren't, I think they probably are. But, you know, I think... It's just, it's just great. We learned so much um, and, and they can guide you on some strategy there as well. And one of the things they taught us was, okay, get enough money to go to market properly, get a year's worth of data, and then um, take that data and rate your US round. So that's another interesting, clear strategy that you can undertake um, as well. They did also tell us that Sometimes you need to do that twice before you can ignite the US investors. So just got to be prepared to be able to really get a good cup two or three years done sometimes before you can get that US cash in the door, which can probably be pretty difficult. But um, I'm just sharing what I've been told uh, in that area. Does anyone want to add, add to that uh, from their experience and expertise? I'm sure we've all seen quite a bit of this. No? Cool. What about the flip up then, Kathy? So we had to flip up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah. Let's let's talk about what it actually is. Okay. Know, the big things that are important on that one. Sure. Um, so uh, just to sort of back up a little bit in terms of trajectory, some of our Australian clients come to us. They set up a U.S. subsidiary. They go on to do amazing things, grow organically, never need to flip, or they get acquired by a U.S. company. Um, one of my Australian companies was offered a great, great uh, opportunity to sell their company to a U.S. entity. And right before we tried to close, they said, oh, wait, I think we would rather you be a U.S. company and then we'll buy you. So why don't you flip first? And we we're like, that's ridiculous. You can get great Australian counsel, um, figure out Australian law and, and just go ahead and buy an Australian company and you don't need to make them go through that silly flip process. But um, many, like Cake, many, many Australian companies are doing really well, expand to the US, are surrounded by eager US investors who say, uh, we'd like you to be a US company. And what they mean is you've, you know, Cake at one point had its Australian parent and it had a Delaware sub. And I'm just guessing because I don't know the particulars, but that USVC said, love to invest in you, need you to do a flip. And what that means is that Delaware subsidiary 
issues shares to the shareholders in Australia so that the Australian shareholders now own um, the Delaware entity and the Delaware entity owns 100% of the Australian company. And all the IP is sitting in the, or at that point in time, all the IP is sitting in the Australian company. Then the US VCs are comfortable going ahead and able to invest. Um, in the absolutely in my, my layman's terms even though I have an account with still you know way I sort of describe it is you know we actually yeah so we put a company in on top of our Australian company and then we moved we replicated the exact shareholding and all the ESOP and everything we just moved it up a level so instead of having that whole like all your safes and notes and shares and options in the Australian company we made a US one and then we moved it all up but then there's like a tax transaction that happens. So you need like Australian tax lawyers and accountants and stuff to make sure you don't cause a huge tax headache um, when you yeah. do it. And there's normally rollover relief. So there's, there's a whole big palaver that you can go through in Australia. And, and then you have US attorneys set everything up in the US and they kind of work together. And then it all right. kind of happens. But it's like, if I'm an accountant and I, it was the most hectic thing nearly I've ever seen in my life. Like yeah. we've been refused down a track and we had like all sorts of legacy junk like heaps of us do before you finally get one to go to take off. And right. like, you gotta, you got to deal with all that. So like it's a bit of a beast, uh, costs a lot. Just be aware, it, like put, yeah. the, put the cost into your raise as well or whatever because yeah. like it's the biggest yeah. legal bill you'll have ever seen in your life. Like. Um, well, first told me, I was like, fuck, I could probably use productizing a bit now. And I'm not trying to hassle lawyers at all, Kathy, but like it's a bit of a shock. <laughs> yeah, it, it can be. So it's a, the caveat is that with some of our Australian companies who come to us and they're like two founders in a, in a safe, doing a flip for that, much less time, much less money. Also, our oh, yeah. firm, you know, to do a little commercial, we're not a humongous law firm. And so our fees aren't at that level. But yes, depending on how complex your structure is, if you've got lots of preference shares and different um, series of preference shares, that increases the cost and the time to do the flip. Absolutely. And uh, another interesting, I've had a couple of different clients come to me and say, you know, we're super excited. Someone wants to put 200,000 into our company. And so we want to flip. And I'm like, don't flip for $200,000. You need right. to have, and this is, you know, I can't tell you the dollar happy level, but you need to be, have some investors who are really willing to put in big, big money before you fool around with a flip. So. 100%. Yeah, I had someone ask me about a 25K, like accelerator <laughs> check, and I was like, oh, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So we're getting close. So let's do some Q&A. So anonymous attendees has asked, can you convert a Wyoming LLC into a Delaware C Corp? I reckon you can, but this is a Kathy question. <laughs> sure you can. Uh, it would be a, a bit of a pain, but you definitely can. You can convert from any state to any other state. Um, but and What's your uh, what's your email address, Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> and you can well, do those things in January, not in December. <laughs> We'll share our information uh, for you to get in contact with us. Um, so, I mean, a lot of that. December 31st is our end of the year, and unlike Australians with uh, June 30th, so... Um, Everybody's is, hectic. Yeah. Cool. Um, it says, Jason, knowing what you know, would you just skip the Australian experience? Um, unfortunately, it depends on many things. So I have a family that lovely bit where I live and I wanted to build a tech company on the Gold Coast so I think every situation is different and so you know I really wanted to build a Queensland company and so I'm very proud that we started here and plus like I didn't know any investors in the US and so I think it's sometimes easier to get your pre-seed done in your own city or state like you've got to lean on your own friends and family and your own network and, and all that trust um, to get that first bit of money in the door I think it was very difficult to raise money in the US, like that pre-seed round without a network there already, you have to go build the network. So you might as well just do it in your own city. I think there does come a point where if you wanted to go to market in the US, 
Like the, for me, the, that's the key point. Like, when do you want to be getting customers in the US, and how committed are you? Are you going to move there? Like, if you wanted to move there and hit a city up and go to market straight away, then one hundred percent, you might get your pre seed round and you put your travel money, your accommodation in there, and you just get over there. Uh, that that seems reasonable to me. Um, one thing though, like, um, not to make this too complicated, but. If you read Disciplined Entrepreneurship, which is one of the best books on, you know, startups, uh, it talks about having uh, your beachhead market. So I think Australia is a wonderful beachhead market in many markets and you need a smaller market where the competition isn't so great normally to get your shit together. And so I think it's nice to actually do all that learning here, find a little niche that isn't so competitive, which is what Kate did. We're able to push the other smaller guys kind of out of the market, take it over and then utilize all that experience and track record and credibility to go on and, and expand. So that would be, I, I still think that would be the, the blue ribbon approach. But I think it also, um, it creates really good discipline starting a business in Australia and New Zealand as well. And that, that's all we see a lot of the companies now that are heading over there um, are actually really well regarded because profitability has always been something that's been, you know, a, a feature for them or, you know, has been much more in the the near term focus than US businesses. And given that the way the market is right now, investors are very heavily focused on when can companies get to break even and when can they get to profitability. And because there's not the sheer volume of money that exists in the ANZ region yet from an investment perspective, you have to be really smart with how you spend your money and you have to be really dedicated to building an efficiently run business, which I think when you then get to the US means your fundamentals are very well structured to be successful and, you know, run a business that will turn to profitability relatively quickly. Sometimes in the US, we can see businesses raise very large rounds and now are doing very heavy cuts because they kind of grew in this sort of gluttony way where it was like, hey, there's always going to be more money coming. So I don't need to think about how efficient I'm being with every dollar that I'm spending. So I think the market here is very good for toughening you up, really figuring out if you have a good idea or not, because it's much harder to succeed with little money. And then when you're there, you're kind of ready to go and ready to fight. Awesome. All right. So let's rapid fire a few questions here. So Marie has a question about a what are your thoughts on tax implications in completing form W8BEN-E for an Australian company? Kathy, you across that? No, is anyone across that? No way, that? I'm not a tax lawyer, seen, sorry. What have I, where have I seen that W8BEN? What is that form? Is that like a, we'll have to come back to you on that one, Marie. So I'll take that one down as an action. Um, next up, we have Emma. I'm a repat. Does that mean you went to the US and came back? I think so. I wanted to start in Australia. However, I'm becoming increasingly aware of the lack of TAM. Yeah. Yep. And the brain drain. Yep. So look, from a cake perspective, um, we would love to have a big TAM. We'd be a much bigger company today if we started in a big company and we could have gone in a straight line. Like expanding has been super, super hard. But at the same time, we may never have succeeded if we were competing against Carter from day one. So um, I think it's it's a double-edged sword. You have to understand your market. You have to understand your product. You have to understand the competition in the space. And if you can find like a little patch in Australia to go, go for it. But if you can do the same in a big market, I'll probably suggest doing it in a big market because it sucks to have to do all that expansion stuff because it's, it's pretty hard. Um, right, quick uh, quick one there. Uh, B2B, oh, James, what did James say? Based on what Georgie knows now, would she take an AU startup to the US first or follow her previous employer's path to the UK first for a B2B SaaS? Interesting question. Uh, I, I think it really depends on the product that you're selling. Um, so, I mean, we, we went to the UK. It was actually purely because of a um, one of our founders wanted to move there. So... Um, it wasn't necessarily a strategic decision, but um, I think, you know, it's a it's another Commonwealth country. Um, the payroll, it was a payroll product. So the payroll scenario in, in the UK versus Australia is completely different again. Um, so 20% of our product had to be rewritten for that market. So it, it really just depends. And, you know, whereas we looked at the, U, the US market and we had to write a software system for 50 different states, or we could have started in one, one state and just focus on one state. So I think it can depend on um, personal circumstances, but also 
where you see your your product fit um yeah okay well one yeah. one last question we're gonna go right out of time it's an interesting one with the recession um potentially recession um is it a good period to be launching in the us for tech businesses um i have really interesting insight on this um a lot of companies are not being funded. So if you are funded, potentially that's an advantage. So I think you need to look at your own situation, your own funding and, and sort of make that assessment for your industry. But it, funded companies have a major or, or profitable companies have a major advantage over everybody else. And you have to assume that your competition, some of your competition is struggling pretty badly. Um, so I think it is there's potentially good opportunities for people. Anyone have any other insights on that? I always like to refer to uh, Ayrton Senna quote where he says, it's really hard to overtake people in the dry, but it's very easy to overtake a lot of people in the wet. And so I think in a market like this, if people are hurting, get there, you know, get to the US and and take advantage of being able to establish a really good market position very quickly, as opposed to when it's rosy for everybody. Yeah. Well, I, I, also what Jeremy said earlier on profitability. I think if if you have established profitability in Australia, then, um, then that, that's a really good position to be in. Awesome. All right. Well, look, I think it's a great optimistic way to finish um, <laughs> in potentially gloomy times. Um, Australian founders are some of the best in the world. Um, we all know many of them. We've all helped many of them. And, you know, we're all very grateful to be here to help you navigate some of those challenges and make sure you do hit us up. We're going to be sharing a bunch of information after this via email, including the recording. So we appreciate your time. We hope we've done uh, your time justice. We certainly tried. And um, yeah, good luck with expansion and um, happy holidays as they stay in the US. <laughs> Thanks to the panelists Guys. as well. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.